Annie T. for extending an invitation for me to attend and allowing me to return to my educational roots as an industrial and systems engineer. And I'm proud to say that I'm probably one of your newest IISE members, so I'm looking forward to my membership with the organization. I do also want to say um, thank you to any veterans in the audience or those currently serving. I know I met a wonderful gentleman that came from India, serving in India's Air Force. Thank you so much. So let's give a round of applause for all our veterans and those who are here. So I'm excited to be here because I am amongst kindred spirits. And it's comfortable because you get me. And though it's been a while since I practiced pure industrial and systems engineering, I wondered how much the discipline had changed and evolved over the past 40 years since I began my studies. So I remember when Fortran cards were the technology of the day. And now we've evolved to artificial intelligence like IBM's Watson. So I tell you what I did and what I've been told. If you want to know anything about anything, you go on YouTube, and I did. And I searched IISE, and wow, the floodgates opened. And I found the IISE channel. And universities around the world posted videos on what it was like to be an industrial and systems engineer. And though the technology and processes of our education have evolved, the basics were still there. I knew I wanted to be part of something greater than myself, and I wanted to do it in service to our nation in the Air Force. So I was going to be like my dad, become an airman and fulfill my passion of traveling around the world, and the next step was deciding what career field I would pursue. By then, I figured out what my dad did in the Air Force, and he was a personnelist, which meant he ensured all our military records were up to date, and it had an HR, human resources uh, type activity. But for me, though, I have always loved math and sciences. So I attended engineering summer camps at NC State University while in high school, because we were living in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I decided I wanted to become an engineer. And additionally, at that time, the Air Force offered full four-year scholarships to those majoring in engineering to go to any school in the United States they desired. So I applied for an Air Force ROTC scholarship I remember receiving a letter from the Air Force stating, congratulations, you've been selected as an alternate <laughs> for scholarship. And if someone else declined their scholarship to attend the service academies or for other reasons, then my chances increased of receiving the scholarship. But for the time being, I was on my own. So having the engineering camp experience at NC State and being able to afford in-state tuition I applied for and entered NC State as an industrial engineering student. And within weeks of starting my freshman year and enrolling in Air Force ROTC, one of my instructors congratulated me again. And he says, I, as I had indeed moved from alternate status to select status and was awarded a full four-year ROTC scholarship for engineering that included tuition, fees, books, and $125 a month. Woo! <laughs> I then applied to Southern Cal and was accepted and could now afford to attend the private school in the city where I was born. Shortly thereafter, another discussion took place with my ROTC instructor, and he asked what I thought about flying. And I told him, I've been flying all my life. I've been flying since the age of two. My father was in the Air Force. And he offered more specifically, what do you think about piloting? And I hadn't considered piloting as a career. As it was new again for the Air Force, and we hadn't had women flying in the military since our WASP did in World War II. And he stated that because women currently serving on active duty had successfully completed pilot training, I could compete, and if accepted, I could go to pilot training, and if not accepted, I could still retain my engineering scholarship. So I began to think, why be a passenger and I can be the pilot and have the best window seat on the plane. The Air Force now operates in a changed strategic environment where the globalization of technology now allows potential adversaries access to cutting edge science and technology research. And the Air Force Science and Technology Strategy unveiled just last month 
restructures the Air Force's science and technology portfolio and management processes by executing these three objectives. So the Air Force will focus on developing and delivering transformational operational capabilities by restructuring the science and technology portfolio and management processes, enhancing the competition for ideas, and sustaining and enabling an enduring and scientific technological base. Reforming the way science and technology is led, the Chief Technology Officer will guide strategic, scientific, and technology decisions, prioritize activities, and coordinate across the Air Force to effectively convert scientific and technical investments into new capabilities. The Chief Technology Officer also will nurture all of the Air Force's scientific community and ensure effective workforce development for civilian and military scientists and engineers. Michael Hughes of ISC here with Lieutenant General Stacy D. Harris, who was the opening keynote speaker for the IISC 2019 Annual Conference and Expo, and crowd she knocked the socks off of them. Uh, great speech today, but I'm going to ask you some questions based on me being a little kid who grew up behind an airport. What's your favorite plane to fly? Because you're an actual pilot, not just right. an engineer. Mm -hmm. And what does it feel like to actually be behind the stick? I mean, we're all set in an airplane, but you, you drive the train. I have to categorize it in, in two categories. Okay. One is military. All right. Military is a C-141 cargo transport. Now since retired, mm -hmm. was the airlines of the military, and I loved it because we traveled around the world. And that plane was so overpowered, you never worried about taking off or getting into different airfields because it was just so much fun. Really? Civilian-wise, the 747, hands down. The big jumbos. The big jumbos, yeah. Just loved it. Once again, traveling around the world, which was my passion, and uh, it really was a queen of the skies. So describe piloting. What's it like to be behind the stick of one of those big jumbo jets? So piloting is absolutely incredible. Just the thrill of having the control of an aircraft like the 747 that is 850,000 pounds and lifting that puppy off the ground and into the skies is exhilarating. And the same thing coming down to land because you want to make it as smooth a landing as possible. Our egos are pretty much based on our landings. Really, that <laughs> defines what that is a good pilot versus a not good pilot. <laughs> Although, although we all have not so good landing days, but just being able to land that puppy you know, safely so that passengers who are destined to, to go somewhere know that they've arrived safely to their destination. The media kind of uh, stereotype of a pilot is, is your cowboy, Lieutenant General Chuck Yeager, people like that. You know, the right stuff. You're a tech girl, you're an engineer. Mm -hmm. Totally different paradigm. What's better for being a pilot, the cowboy or the engineer, or does it matter on what plane or mission you're doing? <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both. And, and girls have the right stuff also. And of course. So <laughs> We've got one right here. <laughs> I think having that engineering background, though, although it's not essential, I think it is definitely value-added because there's a lot of complex problem solving that goes into piloting. Once again, climbs, descents, approaches in smooth air or diversions and, and alternate locations when flying conditions deteriorate. Mm -hmm. And so having that complex engineering skill makes it so much easier to do your job. Hmm. So all the parabolas and things and when you're driving around or actually flying around, you know, you've got that stuff in your head from your advanced calculus classes already. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. You were in the inspector, the inspector general for the U.S. Air Force, and your list of the things that you ever saw, you know, counterintelligence, nuclear, conventional, it's a list this long. It kind of looked like you did more than 15 minutes by accident than most people did in a week on purpose. How did you do it and how did your ISC skills play into doing that? Right. Well, my ISC skills absolutely played into it because, once again, it's complex problem solving and managing so many different diverse organizations. So, Air Force Inspection Agency, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, DC-3, Defense Cyber Crime Center. What I was fortunate to do were to have leaders in each of those organizations that were the subject matter experts and their subordinate teams also. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to know everything about everything. I just needed to have a great team that knew what they were doing, and I was able to advocate for them every single day. So you knew where to turn to to get the information that you needed to move it up the chain. Absolutely. This team or that team or the other team. Yes. A lot of your speech talked about the, the advantage 
advantages and the opportunities for ISEs in the military, specifically the Air Force. I forget the acronym that you used, AF something RL? AFRL, Air Force AF, Research Lab. Air Force Research Lab. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit more about that and do we have enough ISEs in the military or do we need more and does leadership recognize their value now? What we absolutely need are more industrial and systems engineers and our Air Force's engineers. And specifically, I was talking about civilian engineers. Not a lot of people know about the opportunities to be a civilian engineer. We have 17,000 in our Air Force. And Air Force Research Labs leads the technology and science of our Air Force. So why not be in the leading edge of innovation and technology and presenting new ideas with, with everything that we're doing? And so I would like to see industrial engineers there. Because also the Air Force emphasizes lean processes, six signal, continuous process improvement. It's what the Air Force does every day, it just may not be under the name of industrial engineering, right. but that's what we're doing. So they speak our language even if they don't really know they speak our language yet. Absolutely, we're speaking the language. What are the areas of the military can ISEs apply their skills at? Absolutely. So in, in, in addition to engineering to apply your skills, um, if you're a uniformed officer, you can also become a pilot, RPA mm -hmm. pilot cyber operator, space operator, flight test engineer. I mean, the, the opportunities are boundless. And then as an engineer, it doesn't strictly have to be an industrial or systems engineering specific career field. It could be broader engineering where you bring your skill sets. And once again, the talent that we bring, which is really that, that unknown talent of lean, Six Sigma continuous process improvement, can be in any myriad of engineering opportunities that our Air Force offers. It was one thing during your speech, you talked about the civil engineering aspect of it, of flying into the middle of nowhere, no planes can land, and within what a day or two you set up an entire base where you can land planes. Absolutely. So can you imagine how valuable it would be to have an industrial systems engineer on the ground surveying their land and saying, hey, here's how we can do this better as far as mm -hmm. building the base and the runway. Right. Our skill sets are unique to them. How cool was it to meet the Tuskegee Airmen? Oh. Because I've been to the museum, I got the t-shirt, but I've never talked to one of them, and you have. Yeah, the Tuskegee Airmen are really my family, and I just adore them. And once again, I met them right before I went to pilot training, so they've been my inspiration my entire wow. career. I mean, they are my heroes and my sheroes, and so I just, I just love them dearly. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>